on. Now. <laughs> Charles is trying to look up, look out for me, which he does quite well, but I keep telling him, my problem is not going up steps, it's coming down them. Why? I don't know, but I've had exactly the same problem ever since I had my fractured pelvis. I'm not sure it healed properly, supposedly, but there's still a residual there. I hope everybody had a great feast. I know, talked to one person, wasn't able to go to the feast, but they had a great feast also, listening to the sermons and everything. I think we're all very moved by the sermons we heard. I'll tell you, there's one time that I, a lot is up here bragging about being in Hawaii. There's one time I looked over at my wife and says, I don't think we're in Hawaii anymore. And that was during Mr. Kubik's sermon from Panama City. You know what the difference was? They turned on the air conditioner. It was so cold in there, I was, I figured Satan is trying to divert our attention. This message must be very important because of what we were going through up there. And it definitely was not Hawaii, but they promised to get that problem fixed. Well, they did, I'm sure, because Mrs. Walker talked to them. <laughs> we might turn to Romans 8, 20, 8, 33. It was a very profitable feast for me personally, as all feasts are. I'm always thankful that every year God gives me a little bit deeper understanding in how things are working. I don't think after that sermon we got from Mr. Kubik, I will ever look at uh, the Olivet Prophecy in exactly the same way. You know, it just brought it to life. God has been removing his blessings, I think, from modern day Israel for a long time. We don't tend to look at it that way. If you look back in our history, and there was a long feudal war in Vietnam. We had thousands of casualties. At the end of it, the communists took over. And according to the theory that was in place at the time, there was a the domino theory. One nation falls, and the next nation falls, and the next nation falls. What in actuality has happened? Thing has got so stirred up and so different that Vietnam is more on our side versus China than it's everything. It's, it's just confusing. The world just keeps turning around and gets more confusing by the day. You look, every action that the, the United States has taken in the Middle East has resulted in things being worse. We went into Iraq. We threw out Saddam Hussein. And nobody's going to shed a tear over that man. But what came after, and what's coming after, right there, is much worse than we had before. It's, it's hard to believe how bad things are getting. And they've, you know, way back after the First World War, the English and the French created nations in the Middle East. They literally created them. This is what is Iraq is going to be. This is Syria and everything. They didn't take into consideration mixing different people of different, I want to say religions. They're all Muslims, but they don't agree with each other. So you put two different things of together in one nation, you're going to have conflict. I don't care what you do. I want to say that the new groups that are coming up, ISIS and everything, makes Saddam Hussein look like the old proverbial Sunday school teacher. These people are unbelievable what they do. And we say, well, look, you're, you're cutting off the heads of, and what they're doing literally of children and throwing their bodies away. And they look at us and say, what are you talking about? You kill 50 million unborn babies. What are you looking at us for? See, it's all in your perspective. 
A lot of people are willing to vote for certain rights in the United States. They're willing to campaign for those rights. They sit in for those rights. But some of those rights cause that we look whole on like a woman's right to choose. Okay? The world looks at us and says, you guys are crazy. We don't want to follow you. And they believe, since we have killed so many of our unborn children, that we ourselves do not deserve to live. So, it's one thing to hold a certain belief, but are you willing to die for it? Think about that for a minute, because we're going to get a little bit more into that subject a little bit later. Romans 8.33 Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. God's elect. Who is that, brethren? It's you and me. That's what he's talking about. Who is he con who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Jesus Christ is our high priest. He makes intercession for us when we stumble and fall. And we do that too often. We really do. But not when we deliberately thumb our nose at him and sin. But how would we, how would I, how would we all answer Paul's next question? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We cannot do it alone. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hebrews 11. You know, that requires quite a commitment. I'm looking at that. I mean, that's one thing, because frankly, brethren, based on what has gone on in the church before, physically, we haven't had all that r r bad. How many times have us been dragged off and cast into prison like they were in New Testament times? How many of us have been beheaded? But that may be in our future. But spiritually, this age has had a very tough battle. Most of the people left the church, never left it due to persecution. They left it because of failure to follow God, to solidify their foundations. Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, let's point it out. If you can see something, you already have it in your hand, what do you need faith for? You know? You have the faith in God's plan of salvation. That God knows what he is doing and that everything work out to accomplish getting the maximum number of people into the kingdom of God. No other plan will work as well. But sometimes we look at events in the world and what they're happening and we're saying, well, wh why did you do it this way? Why couldn't you do it? But as I said before, God is not going to intervene in this world to make Satan's system work. He is going to replace it totally and completely. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the wor worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. It does not say by science you're going to prove that God created the heavens and the earth. I made a comment up in the 
in uh, Bend. And it's interesting you say Bend. We're actually in Redmond. I still haven't, I'm still working on that one, okay? But for those of you who have been in the church a long time, that have went up to Squaw Valley when it's the feast site, and remember what a great, the only word that comes to mind, almost magical place it was to be. We were warned a long time ago not to go back into that valley after the feast. So one year we did. And it was completely and totally different. It was as if the entire valley was dead. I talked to another man after the feast. He said he went back into Squaw Valley after the feast. He couldn't even stay in there five minutes. It was so different. Why? God had removed his presence. But think about it for a minute. And I had to think about this for a while. That difference that I could feel, my wife felt, the other man, and other people that have done exactly the same thing, is a proof that God exists. Because he's the one that put his Holy Spirit there. Are we Christians because we prove that God exists in the Bible? Are we Christians because each day of our lives we pray to him and he inspires us, he protects us, he gives us everything we need? Is that how we, you know, that's how we actually prove that God exists? What gets internalized, maybe it'd be a way, better word for it, where it becomes part of us. See, the little things in life are very important to us. Because how we live our lives on a daily basis, relying on God, means that when this world crumbles completely and totally around our head, we will automatically turn to God. And we don't know when things are going to fall apart. Mr. Kubik said he had two different plans. One, for in case time goes on, and the other in case time completely Everything about us completely collapses. As he pointed out in the sermon, we've got about, in all our stores, about one month's supply of food to last. Can you imagine what utter chaos would be? And most of the world knows, frankly, that if you want food, you know Mormons store food. So this is going to get very chaotic out here if this is actually near the time of the end. We don't know. I do know we have a limited amount of time personally. This really strikes home because I'm not getting any younger. I don't know about you, my body keeps telling me I'm getting older. I find more and more proof of that every day. I used to be the one to help people move, to move the refrigerators upstairs, up the door. Now I need help to get down off the podium. Times change. It doesn't make me happy. I'm sure everybody that's older, it doesn't make them happy either. But it's the reality of life. But growing old has one great feature about it. It teaches you humility. Even if you don't want to learn it. By faith, Abel slew Cain and lived a long and peaceful life and had many descendants. That's not exactly what happened, is it? By faith, Abel offered a good and more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and though through it, he being dead, still speaks. He still speaks to us by his example. The first righteous man's death should have been a clue that the path of a Christian would not be all that easy. But we read the verses and we, I'm not sure we really, I, I really thought of run the implications of that. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But a, re, but a rewarder when? This is something we need to think about. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. 
That is found, you want for your notes, Revelation 22, verse 12. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, when he started building the ark, there were no rain clouds in the uh, sky. Moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Matthew 7.13 we are being divinely warned of things yet to come in the future, but are we moved by godly fear to make changes in our life? Maybe necessary changes. I have come to the conclusion over the years, to my own personal example and seeing others, to say something is one thing, to actually put into action can be something else completely different. We need to do something. It's amazing because everything, Jerusalem is continuing to be the Middle East, the, the fulcrum of history, of what's going to happen in the future. Jerusalem is going to be the city from which Jesus rules from. But right now, the future of that city is bleak. Can you imagine what would happen if all the Arabs decided to unite? There's no way in the world Israel could stand by herself. I am not sure the United States would even attempt to back her anymore. Who knows? We don't know what the future is going to bring. This country is so near to bankruptcy, or maybe we're so far past bankruptcy, that there's no way this country can ever get out of debt. And one of these days, just like sins, all the chickens are going to come home to roost. And I think, well, maybe it shouldn't, maybe it won't be in my lifetime. But what about my daughter? My son and my other daughter is not in the church. We don't want all this to happen to them, but grandkids. But one of these days, this world is going to fall apart. Matthew 7:13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. John 17:11. Remarking there's no ice. But the drinking fountain out there doesn't work either. And from the looks of the floor, they had a massive plumbing problem of some kind while we were gone. So, if you want to know about wait, how Hawaii is with the waves, all you have to do is try to walk across the floor out there. We actually got the bad parts covered with tables so that uh, nobody gets hurt. I would say, in fact, you know, you can't even find the path that leads to the narrow gate unless God calls you. You know, we can't do it all. We can't accidentally stumble across it. Every year at the Passover, we go through these verses. How well are we doing? And when I ask this, I'm asking myself this question as much as I am you. Now I am no longer in the world, but those are in the world. I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us, brethren. Jesus Christ, the night before he died, prayed for you and me. Think about that. It's been almost 2,000 years, but he's still fulfilling that promise. That they may all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Think of the unity, the Father and the Son. Jesus said he did nothing except what the Father and he told him. 
They agree completely. Their minds think the same way. That they may also be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them. That they may be one. Just as we are one. Notice the repeated one. Unity. Togetherness. I and them and you and me. That they may be made perfect in one. I got a ways to go. We will never get there until we are resurrected in the first resurrection. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Matthew 7, 24. How well are we doing, brethren? <clears throat> are we as one as we should be? And I'm talking about the Oakland congregation. Are we really as one as we should be? When United was formed because... Because, you know, because we started from scratch, we had to go back and reprove all of our basic doctrines. Because we didn't have access to all the old literature anymore. We had to redo it again. To have something to, for people to send to people, to refer to people. We had to do this to make sure that all our basic, all of our booklets were based on God's truth. And when they went through there and everything, the basic doctrines as listed in our Constitution, not one thing changed from what was Mr. Armstrong's in the very beginning. There's a consistency there. But how many different organizations are there claiming to be the one true church? Well, we could start with the universal church. They claim to be the one true church. Well, let's stick with the Church of God. How many apostles are there out there? Uh, probably more than we can number. How many witnesses? In case you're wondering, Lud Kermigian, Mark Rohr, and myself are the two witnesses. <laughs> I say that because two of them get killed. I want to be the third one. <laughs> I'm joking, but you see, there are a lot of people out there, I think someone said they've already met eight or nine people that claim to be the two witnesses. Yeah. I don't, why do people want to be the true witness? They get killed, people. I mean, what are you going to do? Take out an insurance policy the day before and three days later you, you resurrect it and collect the money? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. I really don't think that would work at that time. But is there any unity among the various groups? You can answer that. I think that you and I have greatly underestimated the power of Satan to deceive us. If we, I think if we had a better understanding of how devious he can be, we would all be far more united than we are. But trying to overcome and resist the, what Satan throws at us is what builds character. It is what makes Christians. And he managed to destroy worldwide from the inside. But then, almost like the proverbial phoenix, the church rose from the ashes and is still around. That must be very frustrating to Satan. You know. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, three little words there, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Now we've heard these verses many times. We're not telling you something new here. But notice, the floods and the winds came against both houses. In 
and chances are the houses look the same. The problem came when the floods came. And at that time, the weakness of one house was revealed and the strength of the other house was revealed. Sometimes we all go through a trial. If our foundation is strong, we will stand. If our foundation is weak, we can be in deep trouble. Also in Bend, I use an example of someone that died this uh, last year, Karen. She suffered from MS for over 20 years and everything, but she grew in faith. She was an example to everyone. No one could talk to her on the phone or visit her without coming back inspired. See, we have a choice. We go through a trial. You can go either go through it with God or without God. And most people, hopefully in the church, go through it with God. Some people get upset and leave the church. In 1995, a great storm struck the Church of God, and I lost many friends. Let me put it this way, I'm tired of losing friends. So, why don't you guys stick around for a while, okay? We don't live in a vacuum. What we do affects other people. If you're strong, you can help and be an example to other people. If you're weak, you can potentially harm other people at the same time. We need to be strong. We need to follow God. Friends, my lost friends, I later found out hadn't, had been saying the right things. One man said that he would quit his job but the boss asked him to work overtime so he could not attend the spokesman's club. He is long since gone out in the world. Do we pray, really pray on a daily basis that our foundation is so strong that we can withstand with God's help any temptation Satan sends our way? And he will send things our way. Never assume that you're able to stand on your own. You need God on a daily basis. So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Matthew 24, 3. Jesus spoke with authority because he had authority. But who do we believe that this warning is aimed at? Ourselves or someone else? No matter what the problem is, brethren, the only ones that we can really change is ourselves. Now you spend your I, years ago, I was having problems with another person in the church. So I decided the best thing to do was to pray about it. So every morning, for months, I prayed about that and the other man. That man wound up being a great friend and one that was a great support when I first became a minister. But it struck me when everything was said and done, I looked back at it. I was the one that changed, not him. It took me a long time through prayer to come to the realization that I was the problem not the other person. And it's very easy to see somebody else's faults. And it's a little hard for us to, to admit to our own faults. But you might as well admit to your own faults because God already knows what they are. We might be able to hide them from everybody else, but God knows. And he will help us overcome it if we will let him. Matthew 24, 3. Now as he said on the Mount of Olives, disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell me, when will these things be? 
What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Like I said, after listening to Mr. Kubik, I don't think I'll ever look at the Olivet Prophecy in exactly the same way again. But notice that this warning was directed to disciples, not at the world. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. He's talking to the men that are going to become apostles. That no man deceives you. Now wait a minute. We're in the member church. We can't be deceived, can we? Well, according to Jesus, we can. It's a danger. The only way we can prevent it is to stay close to him and to the Father. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Yeah. This is a man sitting in Rome right now, calls himself the vicar of Christ, who's on this earth in place of Christ. Nobody in the various, anybody else says that, but they say, you know, well, I'm of Christ, I can t tell you, follow me, that's the right way to go. And how many, you got a lot of weird beliefs out here in the world. You know, you, you run into these, you can't wonder what will happen, the time goes on, the next Haley Comet comes, comes back again. Of all the people that thought they were going to be taken up to Haley's Comet, you know, and the people that wound up dead. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. All you have to do is look in the newspaper to find out that that's still true. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. But with each passing year, the weapons that are available to these people can cause the complete destruction of the human race. When we invaded Iraq, we thought that he had weapons of mass destruction. Most people have come to the conclusion that he never had. He was bluffing. Not us, but also Iran. But if he did have the weapons and he moved them out of the country into Syria, Who's got those weapons now? ISIS, maybe. Now that's so scary, you could keep you up at night. I personally think that, I personally hope that there was no weapons of mass destruction there. It's just a question of, of when a lot of these things are going to be used, brethren. The Middle East is, is past anybody being able to bring peace there, frankly. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. There are famines in the world right now. A couple more years without rain, and California is going to be pretty much of a desert. They, they bulldozed a lot of various fruit trees in the valley this last year. If they do it again, and there's no water, they're going to have to bulldoze more of those trees down because they're going to be dead. There is no water for them. But once they're gone, you just don't replace them. How do you replace a peach tree? Okay, you go to the store and you buy a, you know, a young tree. But nobody's growing young trees anymore because nobody's buying them right now. They're ripping things out. So there's going to, there's, it will take a long time under any scenario for all those trees to become productive again. Pestilences, we know what's going on in West Africa. We know what's going on in the United States right now. Now the authorities are scared out of the wits because a lot of the number of those people that came down with Ebola and everything traveled across the country. Is that right now they're trying, before they even had the symptoms of it, okay? They think the risk is low, okay? But they're actually looking for about 800 passengers that were on various flights to make sure they are okay. 
because you haven't been in Africa, you haven't been around anybody, and you accidentally come across somebody that Ebola, you develop the symptoms, you're going to think you had the flu until it's too late. Is ISIS the king of the south? Only God knows. The thought came to mind, or will the king of the south be even worse? We don't know, but we tend to overlook because various things dominate our headlines. Right now it's ISIS, okay? But the general that ruling Egypt right now is sort of a scary man himself. Sissy? Who knows? Egypt has the army. It's well equipped. It should be well equipped. We equipped them, you know? There was this cartoon. Oh, what is this man's name? I cannot remember. But he did this book on his various uh, scenarios, political scenarios. And one of them is an English uh, politician. He said, before we send a gunboat, let's first consider that they too may have a gunboat. The one we sold them. You know? And that's true because we're one of the biggest armed dealers in the world. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Some people seem to think that the third resurrection is a myth. Jesus, in the parable of the virgin, speaks of the wise and the foolish virgins. All, you could say, are members of the church. But five were foolish, five were prepared. They were not prepared when Jesus returned and the doors were closed and they could not enter, the five foolish virgins. It was too late. That was it. It talks about God also, Jesus gave the parable of the tares and the wheat. You just leave the tares there and at the end of the age, everything will be cut back, the wheat will be gathered here and the tares burned. He is not kidding. I'm very happy to know God's plan of salvation because there's nothing I'd like better to take those people of ISIS and be able to teach them the truth, to give them a chance to repent, to get them a, a chance to develop the mind of Jesus Christ. There are future, those other people we're going to have to, not for a thousand years, we're not ready for that yet, believe me. But at some time or another, we're going to we're going to deal with all these people. Have you ever thought of the last great th great throne judgment? What various different kind of people are going to be resurrected then? Babies that died, never had a chance to really live. People that are drug dealers. People who are just ordinary people that live their lives. People like uh, the fanatics in the Middle East that want to rule everybody and they think they'll get to heaven if they blow up things and die in their cause. You're fighting, it's a tough thing when you're fighting people that don't mind dying. You know? That's a tough way, that's a tough foe to have. It's going to be shocked when they wake up and find out that, hmm, where are my virgins? Sorry, it's wrong. Yeah, it's God calling. He wants to know where you've been. It can be said of all of us sometimes, I, I wonder. I'm sitting there in the middle of the dark because in Bend and all those sites, except if you happen to be in Florida, the lights are off. And I keep thinking, did I put my phone on mute? <laughs> you did not want it to ring in the middle of that, and especially since in Bend they have all the ministers sitting in the front. <laughs> Mr. Walker always said that that is not a, uh, a blessing, it's a, uh, <laughs> that is the coldest place in the auditorium. And after last Saturday, I believe him, because I think I had ice on my ears. Again, I knew that was extremely important, frankly. 
Now the question is, where am I? You know, I, I make great notes and sometimes I actually follow them. Sometimes I don't. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. That very word endure should tell us that things may not be all that easy. Endurance means you're trying to overcome something that you have. People that are sick. I can tell you from personal example, when I had the pneumonia three years ago in Hawaii, I mean, that was an endurance contest. And believe me, I didn't have very much endurance in that time. Hebrews 11.13. I think Hebrews 11:13 tells us more than anything else that uh, the rewards that we're going to receive, the blessings, is sometime in the future, after Jesus Christ comes back. And while you're turning, I'm going to be drinking. Hebrews 11:13. And these all died, talking about everybody from righteous Abel to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, on down the list. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. In other words, they had faith, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Verse 32. What more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouth of lions. If there's a lion's mouth to be stopped, I will wait for you to do it, okay? But it says, you know, David did virtually exactly that. Quench the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Woman received their dead, raised to life again. Perfect so far. Unfortunately, he goes on. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Do you know think what Paul went through? Remember he made a listing of all the things? We know at one time he spent, when he was in the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and he said that it happened to him two other times besides that. It's not shown in the Bible. So, and of chains and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That's quite a statement, brethren. But our reward, obviously, is in the future. That's why we have to live by faith. But based on what some of these people went through, when you go home tonight, thank God for where you're living and the things you're going through. Because no matter what you have, it's a whole lot better than living in a cave, believe me.
I mean, think about it. There's some things in the Bible that I puzzle over. You come out to when God called the apostles, he called James and John, who were brothers. They were both apostles. James was the first to die when he was beheaded. John lived clear many, many years, and he broke. We're not sure exactly what happened to him after he wrote the book of Revelation. But we do know from look going in the Isle of Patmos, that was not a good place for an old man to live. It was cold, it was barren, it was all things you don't want. But why did one brother die first, and why did another brother go through all this and live the longest? And I can only tell you, God only knows. The question I want to ask you though is, who was the luckier one? James, who died first, and his next thing he knows he's going to be in the first resurrection. He didn't have to go through all the things that John had to go through in his life. But I'm sure that John did everything willingly. But we don't know what God is going to require of us. We just had to be prepared to do it. Brethren, we have returned from the feast, but unfortunately we're still in the world. Any doubt of that was erased from my mind driving in here today. Because I think for being up there, because one thing about Bend, it's quiet. The traffic, even at its worst, is nowhere near what it is here. But I was not used to the maniacs out here on the road. And someone, you know, you just scared. Rita was driving, and so I could close my eyes. But, you know, but it is, you know, people have a disregard for other people. It's the almighty me. I want to get someplace thing, so what if I put somebody else's life in danger? But have we come back determined to make changes in our life? What if we just spent an extra 15 minutes a day in prayer? In one year, that would be another 90 hours of prayer. Well, we cut back on our TV watching by one hour and devoted that extra hour to Bible study instead of our studying the church booklets or other literature. And you think that would make you a stronger Christian with deeper foundations? That's what I'm talking about. We're back in the world now. There's an old saying, you keep doing what you are doing, you'll keep getting what you have been getting. In order to get a different result, go stronger, we have to change. We have to do our part to help us ourselves draw closer to God. There are some people that never complain despite the trials they go through. There are other people that never stop complaining. I must say that when I was up in uh, Bend, I was business manager up there. I sat in the same office as Larry Walker. And sometimes I wish that all the people could understand how much is done behind the scenes to keep a feast going. And I cannot imagine how they managed to do a feast with 9,000 people there like they did in Squaw Valley 50 years ago. I can remember the first year we went to Squaw Valley. They had a the night before when the, the feast actually started, it took us two hours to get out of the parking lot. We had two screaming kids on our hands. We had spent about six months with our newest uh, Raymond, because he was very young at that time, and she hadn't sat through an entire service for a long time. In those days, we went up there, in eight days we had 17 sermons. We prayed to God. In 17 services, Rita had to get up once. Now, to me, that's answered prayer. That really is. We had a minister come up here. He was going to his history conference over in the uh, University of California. And he came and gave a speak, a sermon. And he talked about the Middle East and the Syria and stuff like that. And I can honestly say that we're new in the church. That was the first sermon I ever heard 
that I didn't understand a word the man was saying. I have since learned a lot about more about history of the thing. He was there at the feast, and I was thinking, oh no, oh no. But he gave one of the best sermons of the feast. Then at the end of the feast, at the end of his sermon, he asked a question. I said, that's great, what's the answer? And he said, but that's the subject of another sermon. My thoughts at that time was, thanks a lot. Yeah. I would be willing to sit there another 30 minutes looking for him to uh, repeat it. Now some people uh, will have trouble attending services if it's in the morning versus the afternoon. Now again, I ask the question, where am I? <laughs> but what I was talking about, you know, these are just suggestions. You know what your problems are. Hopefully if you don't ask God to show them to you. But you need to do something to solve your problems, even those we keep maybe hidden from others. We need to develop a plan of action to make this next year a year of growth. I am not a prophet. I cannot see beyond the end of my nose. But you do not think this next year will be full of peaches and cream, as the old saying goes. You might turn to 1 Peter 2.9. How would you describe yourself in the most basic terms that, that define who we are? Most people would start with one of, one of the following, whether you're a male or a female, nationality, American, Russian, Canadian, whatever. You know. So to break it down by their ancestry, I am Mexican-American, African-American, English, Scottish, French. The end is, is endless, especially in the Church of God, because there are churches all over the world. Our many are a mixture of many backgrounds, some unknown. Or you could define yourself by their occupation. I am a computer engineer. I'm a plumber. Again, the list is endless. Or you could be like me, retired. But, this, but is this how we should see ourselves? Is this how God wants us to see ourselves? 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen generation. We cannot come to God unless God calls us first. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who, are not, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 1 Corinthians 1.28 Peter describes us in less than 30 words. But it's let us look at what Peter tells us. You're a chosen generation. We think we all know John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up the last day. I repeat this a number of times because I think it's one of the basic things we have to understand. We did, God didn't call us because we are great. He called us because we were weak of the world. What did Jesus say about when he was speaking about the nation of Judah at that time? He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the same things you have, the Gentiles would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. He picked the most difficult people to work for. Hi. Now everybody watch them so they said, you know. <laughs> No, don't do that for please. First Corinthians one twenty six. Now everybody follow directions, please. Now this is about the time that I say super califragilisticexpialidocious. 
You ready? Okay, 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world, you and me, to put to shame the wise, and has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. How can you do that, brethren? By making the kingdom of God and the first resurrection. That's the only way you can do this. And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Everything about this society, every form of government, every philosophy, everything is going to be gone, blown away, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Three times Peter uses the phrase, God has chosen. This should make us feel humble. But the next thing that Peter mentions is a royal priesthood. You can look at this two ways, both of which is correct. We are priests serving under the high priest, Jesus Christ. The word for royal, though, used, it means a sovereign. We are also going to be rulers and priests in our own right. But Jesus is called a king of kings and a lord of lords for a reason. Jesus Christ will always be the one in charge. We are a holy nation. Now, nations have their own characteristics. You want to... We went to Israel. You're going through customs to get in the country. They don't understand what a line is. It's just one big glob of people trying to go through there. One person one said one of the most humorous things is for people on a tour in Europe. An Englishman trying to get Frenchmen and Italians to form a line. That's just not the way they do it. My daughter got very irritated when we were going through Israel because people were trying to push over. So she moved her, char her card over and just kind of stopped. We had a group of Filipinos that had been going through and they were actually not in the church, but they were taking a tour of all the holy places from Spain to France to Italy and to the Holy Land and everything. So I started talking to them. You know where they were from? San Francisco. <laughs> I thought that was amazing. Look around you. We are a holy nation because we share the same outlook, have the same Savior, and worship the same God. And we are all trying to develop the mind of Christ. How is this possible? Because we also have God's Holy Spirit working in each and every one of us. From various backgrounds, we are one people. And most of us here, if we're out in the world, and not in the church would have absolutely zero in common. We are his own special people. Our job in the kingdom of God is to help other people enter into that same relationship with God. But Peter tells us that we also... I looked at my watch, I suddenly panicked. I suddenly remember, wait, we didn't start at 11 o'clock, so it's okay. But Peter tells us that we also have a purpose right now. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The King James Version says it even stronger. That you should proclaim. Now I think it's interesting how the sermonette and the sermon work together. But oftentimes as... Mr. Willis pointed out, action speaks greater than words. How we live our lives, how we conduct ourselves, brings honor or dishonor to the church. And I'm sure most of us do our best to set the best example. We try to do that at the feast. And I think basically overall, we succeed. Revelation 5.8 Whole sermons can be 
and have been given on this subject. But I know that I do not personally have the resources or the talent to proclaim the gospel to the world. We as an organization can accomplish far more than we can possibly do individually. Our tithes and offerings are what drives this work forward. But there's also another effect. Tithing gives us a sense of ownership. It's not only United's work, it's our work. The Church of God is, but the Church of God is first and foremost a spirit-driven church. Revelation 5.8 now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Our prayers do reach heaven. God listens to us. Why wouldn't he? After all, he is the one who called us who made us his own people and made us his a royal priesthood. But notice one thing that struck me. I mentioned it again in Bend. But there's no bowl full of cash before the throne. Tithing is required. But prayers are more important. But you know, it's innocent and interesting that God says when you pray, go into a closet, so the only one that knows how much you pray is God the Father. Your mate may know how long you pray or everything, but she doesn't know what you're praying about unless you actually tell her. It's between you and God. That's the way he wants it to be. God interacts with us on a personal basis. Now you can come and you can counsel a minister Everything, but until you actually do something to change your life, everything will remain the same. I don't know. A lot of people are interested in their ancestry. You can go on ancestry.com, and we've done the same thing. And what was not a remark about what we found in my case, this question about what we didn't find. That maybe some things we thought were true about my ancestry wasn't true. My wife found out exactly the same thing. She did not know until she got involved into it. A lot of things about her ancestry. Maybe in shows on TV where people go to find out more about their ancestry, and usually the ones I'm talking about are, you know, famous people. But I remember no saying. Someone said that a person that brags about his ancestry is like the potato. The best part of him is underground. <laughs> we all look forward to seeing our parents, our grandparents of the last great day. When the last great day becomes a reality, not just something we're looking forward to. But you have to realize that we're going to be 1,000 years older than they are. We're going to be spirit beings. We're going to be like God. And God says, it says a day is as a thousand years to God. We are going to have, be capable at those times to really help all these people out here in the world of making this world such a corrupt place. The North Koreans need our help. Right now, the people mixed up in ISIS need our help. The ordinary people outside our doors need our help. But by that time, we would be prepared and trained to help them. He can even say that at that time, we will be their spiritual ancestors. People are interested in their physical ancestry, and this is not wrong. But if you are interested in your spiritual ancestry, Hebrews 11 is a great place to start. Charles Dickens started the novel, A Tale of Two Cities, with it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It might be interesting just as a trivia point, but the, the Tale of Two Cities is the most published novel in, in, in 
that has ever been. The Bible obviously is is printed more, but uh, it has actually outsold such things as Harry Potter over the years. It's been around a lot longer, but it's. But you know, it has a lot of truth in that because we live in one sense the best of times because we are not suffering under physical persecution yet and it's the worst of times because the spiritual things that we have to go through, the spiritual temptations and everything are going to get worse. And as you know from listening to the sermons at the feast, the physical could get a lot worse. We, you might say that the battle has just begun this next year. We don't know what Satan is going to face, face us, but the best way to get it, or I'm not sure what the word just escaped me at the moment, to be able to survive is to stay as close to God as you possibly can. I'm glad that everybody is safely back from the feast. I'm sorry to hear about Peggy Jefferson. We've known her for years. But she may be in a much better place than we are because she doesn't have to go through anything that is about to come. We are.